We're turning, if you would, in your Bibles this morning to the book of Colossians, the third chapter. Those of you that have been following along with our recorded messages the last couple of weeks, yes, we did a several of our sermons were while we were gone as a congregation because of the coronavirus. We did them on the Easter format and Easter theme. And a couple of weeks ago with the videos, we transitioned back to the book of Colossians. The first couple of chapters of Colossians are pure doctrine in all essence. Paul wrote to the Colossian believers in chapter one, beginning in verse nine, and his prayer was that they might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding so that they might walk worthy unto God and be fruitful unto every good work. Wow. That theme is carried forward uh, throughout the scriptures because of the need for the centrality of Christ. And you might think that that is kind of a no brainer, but there are a huge amount of churches in our own land today that uh, have uh, found if they were going to be real honest that Christ is not always central theme for their congregation, for their worship expression, for their involvement, their attitudes towards life. Things can get substituted in there and diminish from the walk that we are to have and the spiritual fruit bearing uh, because we turn our attention to other things. And the Colossian heresy was higher intellectualism. I'm abbreviating it, of course. We've already dealt with it in chapters 1 and 2. The idea that only a, a few of the mystically, mystically enhanced elites could possibly be spiritual in the sight of a non-biblical God in reality because the Colossian heresy didn't even allow for the resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ. It did not allow for the fact that Christ was indeed God in the flesh and a lot of other heresies that went with the predominant one. So Paul emphasized in his, his writing to the Colossian church how necessary it was to keep Jesus Christ central within our pursuit of Christianity. He tells us in chapter 2, uh, and in, for instance, in verse 3, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of, treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Verse 10 says we are complete in him. In chapter 3, he told us the conclusion of these things is that we are to have a heavenly focus. We are to have a worldview that is otherworldly is a supernatural viewpoint of the things of God. Yes, we are responsible. It is needed that we walk here in this life and that we are good citizens with good ethics and good morals and good honesty and good integrity and everything else. But those things are to be inundated within the truth of scripture, the things that are of Christ and what he has revealed to us and then last time we were in the book of Colossians, uh, we took a look at recognizing that we are in a battle. Christianity is often thought of as some type of cotton candy uh, for the circuit's experience, you know, some type of puff and fluff that we, you know, just kind of kind of, you know, garner in a little bit when it's convenient or when it doesn't interfere with, you know, I don't know, who, who can I pick on? Fishing, gardening, duck hunting, uh, you know, whatever it happens to be, you know? Uh, you know no, it's, it's not that at all. We are engaged, as Paul wrote to young Timothy, the pastor of the church at Ephesus in 2 Timothy, he says, we are in a battle. We are to be, understand that we are warriors that we are, in, in military terms, uh, that we are to be understanding of the engagement of the enemy. Okay. Uh, we are to be good soldiers clothed in Christ. Good soldier has to, according to Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God. Otherwise, you're not going to last very long as a soldier. You're going to become a casualty in part or in whole. And that's a sad thing. It really does. As we take a look at the passage in front of us today, only two short verses, but as for the lead-in, we are told in verse 5 through 15 that put on, put off. 
that get rid of the stuff that's going to encumber you and slow you down. Very few combat soldiers carry a 19-inch color TV with them. They don't even carry a second pair of boots. They do carry a weapon and a lot of ammunition and everything else that is going to make them effective as soldiers. I would suggest to you that our putting off and putting on, when it comes to that spiritual armor, we need to recognize that we are soldiers in the army of God and we need to be kind of attentive to what we are clothing ourselves in because we're in the middle of a spiritual battle and there are two aspects of this battle. We often think of, ah, Satan, you know, horns, red underwear, tail, you know, breathing sulfur. Uh, okay, fine, we can pick on Satan, okay? I mean, he is the God of this world. He is the God of this age. He is the, our enemy, the, our adversary, the lion, according to 1 Peter 5, 8, and everything that goes with it. But we have what I perceive as even a greater enemy in many instances, and that is self. Okay. You know, the, the whole pogo thing of years past, I have met the enemy and he is us. Okay. That us sometimes, we have selfishness, we have worldly desires, we have things that pull us off with distractions, and we find ourselves at being neutralized many times as to what is truly important for the Christian uh, so as this passage unfolded, 5 through 15, we found that in verse 14, it says, Above all things, put on love, which is the bond of completeness. Okay? We need to bathe ourselves in this thing. This doesn't mean you always agree with anybody, and it's not has nothing to do with the warm, fuzzy, smarmy, warmy, fuzzy marshmallow type of feeling. Uh, no, this is a commitment to do the things that Christian love does. Okay? Go back and read 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, and you will see all kinds of things that love is and love is not. And every one of them is a verb. Every one of them is an action. It has nothing to do with if you feel like it, or if it's Tuesday, or for an hour once or twice a week. No, love is, love is not. Okay, that is the package that's there. These things and more we look at as we come now to having a thankful heart in verse 15. Let the peace of God rule in your heart to which also you are called in one body and be ye thankful. Wow, that thankfulness. What an amazing thing to have a thankful heart. You know how much of the doldrums you can get out of? How much of the discouragement? that you can flee away from, how much self-struggle that you can bypass completely if you will just have a thankful heart. Oh, it's raining again. There's going to be mud puddles. Yeah, but you don't have to water your lawn. You, know? you don't have to water your garden. You don't even have to wash your car. You know? Let God wash it. Car is his anyway, isn't it? He wants to worship, let him worship. Never mind. It, uh, you get the idea, okay? A heavenly mindset, a heavenly mindset, the mortify, the put off, the put on. Uh, we need to have some kind of device that gets us there. And this is kind of a what, who, and how type of passage. Let's read it, verse 16 and 17. And you think, my goodness sakes, he's only going to get through two verses. And folks, there's time I only get through one verse. See, already you have something to be thankful for. Yeah, huh? See how quick that happens? Yeah. All right. It, uh, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. George Mueller made the comment, the vigor of our spiritual life will be in exact proportion to the place held by the Bible in our life and thoughts. I solemnly state this from the experience of 54 years. The first three years after my conversion, I neglected the word of God. 
Since I began to search it diligently, the blessing has been wonderful. Great has been the blessing from consecutive, diligent daily study. I look upon it as a lost day when I have not had a good time over the word of God. Verse 16 talks about the abiding word where verse 17 really emphasizes the active result. And within this, you have the what? You have the word of God. You have the who? You have Jesus Christ. You have the how? You have the study. We're going to explore those a little bit. It tells us in verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Let, let, you probably, you, know, you may have the word allow. Okay. This is an act of the will. This is a mindset. Remember, first four verses of chapter three, a heavenly mindset, a biblical mindset. This is God's divine prescription. If you are going to tune in to all the appropriate places on the dial that God allows blessing to flow from, first off is the authority of God's word. Okay. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Forget the six o'clock news for your, for your wisdom for your mindset to get through this life and to be able to cope with success and difficulty, prosperity and adversity. Okay. Uh, we need to know where do we go for the right mindset. Forget Oprah's book club, okay? Forget Dan Rather. You know, forget all the philosophers of this age. We've already talked about them in chapter two. Go to God himself. Let it dwell within you, literally to inhabit let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. To take up residence. Wow. To take not just the presence of the Holy Spirit, the presence of Christ in you, the hope of glory. We're talking about let the word abide in you, inhabit your life. Think biblically. That way you will decide biblically and act biblically as a result. Henry, Harry Ironside told, and you might say, well, how, how, do we, how do we handle this as we flow through here? Ironside was visiting a, a, a Scotsman named Andrew Fraser, uh, who was not in good health. He's an older man at the time. And Fraser opened up the scripture and just began to speak on the great truths of scripture to Dr. Ironside. And Ironside asked him, where did you find these things? Where did you glean this from? How did you manage to come up with all of the, the wondrous understanding of the word of God and God himself? Is there a book? Is there a college? Is there a seminary? You know, what, where, where, where can I get this? And, and Fraser told him this. He said, my dear young man, I learned these things on my knees, on the mud floor, of a little sod cottage in the north of Ireland. I thought he was a Scots, he was Irish. There with my open Bible before me, I used to kneel for hours at a time asking the Spirit of God to reveal Christ to my soul, to open the word to my heart. He taught me more on my knees on that mud floor than I could ever have learned in the seminaries and colleges of the world. This is not to put down formalized education if it's appropriate for somebody's life at a certain chapter of that ongoing journey in this veil. It is to recognize that you can get a lot of head knowledge and really never understand the word of God. You have to commit yourself. It has to abide in you and everything that goes with it. Christ's words, God's truths, not men's interpretations. I have nothing against commentaries, but study the word. You'll find that many commentaries, I'll be kind and say, take a little bit of license with what the word actually says. Uh, you need to be very cautious about interchanging men's truth with, with the truths that come from the very pages of scripture, okay? It, uh, these are vital. If in John chapter six, it, after Jesus had been talking about explaining that he was the bread of life that had come down from heaven, it says the, the, the teaching of that was so difficult for many of the, his followers to comprehend and appropriate that virtually all of them left him. And pretty soon there was nothing but the 12. And Jesus looked at Peter and said, are you going to leave too? 
and peter said lord to whom would we go thou hast the words of eternal life in chapter six verse sixty eight he said you you're it well you know we're not we're not going to abandon just because it's difficult just because it's a little bit hard to understand doesn't mean we go oh poo on this we'll go find some expositor someplace some commentator to tickle our ears with no peter would not do that okay? to be richly and abundantly in all wisdom it tells us richly in all wisdom it means abundant uh, the Sophia word, the wisdom word, it's a buzzword in the book of Colossians because of the emphasis of men's wisdom that the heresy had promoted. Okay, yeah, Keep remembering that. Uh, the believer's victory, fullness, and wealth is all bound up in the provision that flows from the word of God. You're not going to find it anywhere else regardless of what the the, the heretics behind the pulpits happen to tell you. It's the identical usage, by the way, in Ephesians chapter 5, where it says, be ye filled with the Spirit. Okay? Being filled is abiding in the presence of the Word of God and its authority. Okay? It's the same thing. It's a parallel passage. You know, it's, uh, there's been much ado and much nonsense promoted about being filled with the Spirit. Study it biblically. It's a whole subject in itself. Okay? We need to realize that the Word of God is hand in glove with the filling presence of the Holy Spirit Himself. You don't get one without the other. There is no contradiction. Okay? They work together within that. The story is told of a pastor who stayed overnight because, you know, it, uh, I'm going to do this ahead of time and then you'll get the, the emphasis of it. And he woke up in the morning, having guested overnight in a home, uh, to a beautiful soprano voice singing, Nearer my God to thee. But it wasn't at the normal rhythm. Uh, it was speeded up quite noticeably. And she repeated it several times in his hearing, uh, the lady singing it. And so he asked her at breakfast uh, about the speed, the tempo that was involved and she said, I guess that's because I wasn't paying any attention to the words. I found that it's a good uh, song to boil eggs by. <laughs> Repeat the first verse five times rapidly for soft boiled, eight times for hard boiled. <laughs> I think we've kind of missed the point if that's our approach to Christian music. Okay? Because it says, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Okay? It, uh, you know, some, some different observations that are here. Uh, what is the method that we go about? Is it just rote memorization of scripture? Is it just mouthing the words, whether they are musical or whether they come from the, the word of God? Okay? It, uh, uh, Karen's sister uh, my first wife's sister, if you don't have a lot of familiarity with, with my circumstances, uh, had, when she was asked to pray over the food at the dinner table, I had gone there and eaten there three times as a non-believer, and I could quote the exact prayer word for word that she was going to say. She never varied. Father, please bless this food to our bodies, nourish and cherish it, and forgive us for that. Amen. She never understood, never spent a time, never had any idea of what she was saying or the meaning of the words. When you sing hymns, whether it's here to yourself, singing along with your car radio, whatever it happens to be, uh, pay attention to the words. By the way, first thing, this is pastoral stuff, okay, but good for you. If it's not biblically sound, flush it. There are plenty of good hymns out there and scripture songs that you can enjoy and be biblically sound. There's some stuff out there, including some of the old favorites, that are not the best stuff you know, to try to, to immerse yourself into because they are not biblically sound. Okay. All right, here we're talking about 
Well, it tells us in chapter 1, verse 28, speaking of Christ, Paul writes, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. Warning and teaching. The word warning there is the new theto word, the word we often translate counseling. Okay? Now, that's a modern term that's not found actually in Scripture because warning actually means admonition. It means you teach by saying, watch out, that's dangerous. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Didasco is the teaching word used there, okay. and it is the instruction directly from the word of God. That's the way it's used almost universally. Here in chapter 3, it says teaching and admonishing, same two words. Okay. In other words, there's got to be some content got to be some form, some decently in an order principle. There has to be the opportunity to glean from it the truths that come from Scripture. It's not just blah, 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 and blah. You get the idea, okay? It, uh, it tells us in Romans 12, 2, that we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. Doink, doink, doink. Mindset, transformed, metamorphosed, okay? It's a caterpillar to butterfly, that type of stuff. They were changed in that regard. It's inclusive, by the way. Notice that but verse, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, things hummed under your breath. Okay. Yeah, I think it all probably fits into that. Uh, you know, it's uh, in the Old Testament, it was used primarily for what is often called the wisdom literature. Uh, you know, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon, and so forth. It, uh, you know, those type of things. Uh, but you kind of get the idea that is there. Uh, you know, it's designed to impart spiritual truth. Just a cute little ditty that goes nowhere. I mean, it's kind of like Australian movie. Starts in the middle, goes both directions, winds up nowhere. Uh, yeah, well, that's, if you've ever watched Australian movies, you know what I'm talking about. It, you know, we're tried to watch Australian movies. <laughs> It, uh, some of our psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs are just about in that category. In fact, some sermons are just about in that category. Okay? Uh, you know, keep, uh, be aware of this. It's not primarily to make people feel good. The psalms and everything that went with it are designed to teach, to instruct, to reinforce. Sometimes it's teaching history. Sometimes it's reinforcing doctrine. But I think we can get the idea here. It is not a stage performance, and it's not about even carrying a tune. God is not interested, he's not, I shouldn't say interested, he's not concerned with whether you can carry a tune or not, okay? For those of us that don't sing well, if we're behind you, you might be interested in the fact that we can't carry a tune, but God is, that's not his primary concern, making melody in your hearts as unto the Lord, Right? Yeah, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. It's phrased almost identically in the comparative Ephesians 5 passage. Everything that goes with it. You know, if there is no grace being flowing inside, then I question whether it's of God. Uh, just as a kind of a, an aside, I did not put this list together. I'm going to make my disclaimer right off the bat. I stole this. It's called plagiarizing. Uh, I stole this from somebody who's a lot, probably a lot smarter than I am. But the idea of comparing the words that we sing to what our life's actions actually are. He, he puts down th this commentator. We sing sweet hour of prayer and content ourselves with maybe 10 minutes a day. We sing oh for a thousand tongues, but we don't use the one we have for praise. We sing there will be showers of blessing, but we Avoid places that it's raining, God's word. We sing, blessed be the tie that binds, but if somebody offends in one little thing, we get mad and go off in a huff. We sing, onward Christian soldiers, and sit waiting to be drafted, and then bellyache about having to get off the porch. We, serve, we sing, serve the Lord with gladness, and grumble about everything that we have to do. And we sing, I love to tell the story, but it may have been weeks or even months since we actually told anybody what the story is about. Okay. Ah, wow. I mean, I don't know about you. I read through that and I feel a little nervous. 
because I see some application in my own life to those things, okay? The direction in verse 16, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, okay? That's what worship is, okay? That's one expression of what worship is. You're doing it unto the Lord. It's kind of, kind of fun because it goes like this, with charis in your cardia unto the curios, okay? Those are the Greek words that are in there. With grace in your hearts to the Lord. And the heart was the decision. Remember the context. We think of the heart and we think of the gushy Hollywood romanticized thing. That's not what the language structure is in the New Testament. The heart is the decision-making center. The mind up here was the repository of the intellect and it contained all the fact. It was the hard drive okay, of your computerized mentality. The heart is where you pull that down and then make willful, volitional decisions based upon the knowledge. That was, we don't do it that way, and sometimes some confusion results from that. It, uh, the H.P. Uh, Barker, most of you probably have never heard the name, made the observation that he looked out of his garden one day, British guy, so it was a public garden, and he saw over the course of a few hours three different situations. The first thing he saw was a butterfly. The butterfly was beautiful and it light from one flower to the next, never more than a couple of seconds. Butter, flutter, 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 gorgeous butterfly, flew off. Okay. It uh, touched a lot of different blossoms but never settled in uh, on anything. A little while later, a botanist came. You know, I've got a great big notebook horn rim glasses, tufts of hair sticking out sideways, you know, typical guy, you know, and he'd go around looking at flowers, make copious notes and examine in detail and write more and write more. And he finally closed his notebook and went on home. And then uh, Mr. Barker observed a honeybee that flew around for a while, lit on a particular flower, and just immersed himself down inside the petals of the flower and sucked as much pollen and nectar as he could and then flew off, okay? The bee came empty and went away full because he took advantage of what God had provided. Well, I think the application for the Word of God is pretty straightforward. We are to teach and admonish, we are to teach and warn, we are to teach and to learn those things that are out there, and we are to share these things and expressions of worship, including song. Okay? They are to have meaning, they are to have purpose, they are to have the structure that necessitates that, and we need to be praising God for it all the way through. You see, the power of this the power. Are you interested in power in your life? You just want to be the 97-pound weakling laying on the beach that the bully kicks the sand in front of. No. You want the power for life, the ability to live a victorious Christian life, then you need to immerse yourself in the flower of God's Word. You need to get in there and get what is available all the way through. There are so many of these things uh, that have to do with this. In Psalm 19, in our scripture reading a few minutes ago, we took a look at the fact of how King David was praising God for God's provision of his commandments, his, the teaching, the instruction of his word, and how his life was enriched and blessing upon blessing was flowing from that. Or you can just read Psalm 119, and you'll get the same thing in the non-concise form, you know, of a long and lengthy thing, okay? All kinds of this stuff. It, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of, where do we go? You know, Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth in John 17. Hebrews 4.12 tells us the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. You know, wow, this is amazing stuff. It, uh, Peter talked about growing grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, there's just passage after passage. You know, in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, you remember Abraham's instruction 
when the rich man said you know just send somebody back you know from the dead to talk to my brothers who are on bound for hell you know and the miraculous provision of something like that will make all the difference to them and Abraham said no it won't they have Moses they have the prophets they have the Old Testament scripture if that doesn't turn their heart in the direction of their life it doesn't make any difference what kind of miracle you do in front of oh they'll go oh wow man wasn't that cool wasn't that great wasn't that something special and then they'll just keep right on the pathway to hell he said but if the word of God gets into their life the word of God touches their soul if the word of God turns their heart they'll be changed people that's the difference and that's what Abraham's point was all the way through the active result we've looked at the abiding word and the necessity to have that mindset that's there that goes with it the active result is found in verse 17 and that's a English grammar we call it a conjunction conjunction uh, if you want to remember what a conjunction does okay con junction okay everybody here knows what a road junction is it's where things are where two paths are brought together to intersect okay con means exactly what you think it does two coming together that type of thing this is a conjunction is something that reaches out to the prime at least the primary truth of the preceding verse and shows how it fits with the verse that is going to unfold in other words it's a connective okay between verse 16 and 17 so he says and whatsoever you do in word or deed do all in the name of the Lord Jesus and we're coming back to thanks in just a moment whatsoever pretty all-inclusive first Corinthians 10 verse 31 right whatsoever you eat or drink or whatsoever you do do all to the glory of God yeah. and we said well yeah I'm, I'm willing to get into this whole church thing on Sunday morning for an hour but you know I've got my own life to lead no you don't as a Christian first Corinthians 6 19 says you're bought with a price you're not your own therefore your obligation your duty your marching orders as a soldier in God's army is to what obey the orders of your commanding officer so it says do all to the glory of God I love this because when I go back for thirds on ice cream I can do it for the glory of God. No, never mind. <laughs> I'm just seeing if any of you are awake or not. Yeah. But, uh, you know, but you know, whether it is, in fact, your diet or your hobbies or your life's vocation, your thought processes, what you read or don't read, what you watch on the TV, you know, you pick one out. Is it honoring to God? Yeah, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory. That's pretty all-inclusive, isn't it? That all thing there that goes with it. Okay? In word and deed, the word deed, you may have toil or labor. That's what it means is toil. It, in all areas, note that speaking is doing okay? when scripture is involved. You don't say, well, well, we'll talk this and then we'll do that. Okay? Uh, that's not the way scripture is designed. Scripture says, here's the truth, and it needs to be integrated in what you do. It's not truly getting into your life unless you are living the outflow of that truth. Get the idea? James says in chapter 1, verse 22, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. I've noticed in my own life, maybe you have too, the I can justify something I've already decided I, wanted to, I want to do. Yeah. Isn't that, yeah, I mean, isn't that, that it, it, yeah. yeah, that's really something, and pretty soon, you know, I get out of, I'm maneuvering stuff to, I actually got myself convinced uh -huh. that that's the way to go, yeah. yeah, we can deceive ourselves, now, I don't care about the third bowl of ice cream, yeah, well, I do, but, <laughs> the, the understanding that we have to have is you're not going to fool God. Okay? And you need to be honest in the sight of God. You need to, 
go to the throne of grace with open integrity and transparency in your spiritual life because God knows and he wants the best for you, but that whole self battle that we already mentioned can be a really difficult thing. It really can. It, uh, Paul talked about in his spiritual toolbox in, in Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, he talked about the things that are just and lovely and of good report and honest and so forth. And then he says in verse 9, the things that you have learned and heard and received and, and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Notice that? Do them. Not just put them up here. Do them as an outflow of your life. Then God's peace will be preeminent in your life. Then the blessings of that relationship of Christ in you, the hope of glory, will actually bear fruit for the glory of God and for our blessing. And please notice in verse 17, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now that's, uh, that can be, that can barely get to be a PS. That can really get to be an add-on. Because we, in Jesus' name, amen, we do that all the time. In Jesus' name, amen, and it gets to be just kind of a rote type of thing that we just spit out, boom, 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 just like a machine gun right at the end. Okay? The, last, the last rounds on the belt of ammo, uh, that's not what we need to be aware of. And I know we're going to fight the tendency, at least I do, but what we're talking about here is understanding, recognizing and understanding and being submissive to the authority of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the authority. There is in the movie Prince of Persia, uh, kind of a fun little no-brainer piece of fluff, uh, there is about a kid that was caught in the marketplace stealing an apple, uh, and he was about ready to have his hand chopped off uh, because of his being a thief, when the king of this Mideast country, Persia, rode in. And in the middle of all of the militancy and the policemen and the guys with swords and the crowds and the rich people and the shopkeepers and the riffraff off the street and everything else, what you have is the, the king's, I guess you'd call him sergeant at arms, lets people know, in the name of the king! And everybody in the square dropped to their knees. because of the authority that that name represented, okay? Now, the movie people did it for a whole different purpose. They did it for theatrical purposes, but they got it right. Okay. They got it right. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, seated at the right hand of the throne of God, King of kings and Lord of lords, Okay. You go back to the book again, once, once again, going back to the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 7, 8, and 9. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay. He is, whether we recognize him as not, he is King of kings and Lord of lords. So we have an ability the opportunity to tap in to the authority of Jesus Christ's presence in our life. Okay. Better make sure you're doing it his way because you're going to be accountable for doing it rightly. Okay. That's the whole point of this all the way through. Okay. And we need to be doing this with thanksgiving. It tells us as the verse closes, giving thanks to God the Father through him, through Christ. Okay? In the name of Jesus, thanksgiving. It, uh, you know, it's uh, some, some uh, I guess, humorous, put it this way, things to be thankful for. Okay? Again, tongue in cheek. For dishwashers, 
they make it possible to get out of the kitchen before the family returns for the next meal. For husbands who do small repair jobs around the house, and it usually makes them a big enough job to call in the professional and actually get it fixed. For the bathtub, the one place the family allows mom time to herself if she remembers to lock the door. For children who put away things and clean up after themselves. There's such a joy you hate them to see go home to their parents. <laughs> for gardening, it's a relief to deal with dirt outside the house for a change. For teenagers, it gives their parents opportunity to learn a second language and culture. And for smoke alarms, they let you know when the turkey's done. <laughs> it, uh, again, just a dab of humor injected there. Giving thanks to God the Father. Notice the heart expressed attitude here. That drives the speaking and the doing. If you don't have a thankful heart to begin with, the rest of it isn't going to get done very well. It's going to be just surface at best and not have real spiritual value. To God the Father, through Christ, because it's Christ's work that allows us to come into God's presence to begin with. Our doing should have a thankful heart. God's victory studied or formula uh, on the who, what, and how. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15. Paul told Timothy that from a young man in chapter 3, verse 15, he had known the scriptures were able to make him, lead him to salvation in Christ. And it tells us in those famous verses that that uh, uh, the, the word of God is that which provides instruction, correction, reproof, and rebuke. Why? Because it is the living God breathed, that's inspired by God himself, and it is able to make us complete for every good work in verse 17 of chapter 3 when the chapter closes. Yeah. It, uh, we are to grow in grace. All those things that go with it. it uh, I'll just skip that one. We, uh, we find ourselves expected to get on the path and stay on the path. How shall a young man know where to walk? in life's journeys. That's what King David wrote in Psalm 119. And he said, follow the path of God. Follow the path that is lighted by the truth of Scripture. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And cleanse my way through your word. Psalm 19 has such relevancy for that. Jesus said in his great high priestly prayer that I've already mentioned, Sanctify them through thy truth. Father, thy word is truth. You want to know the path? You want to know the methodology? You want to know the who? It's Jesus Christ. It's the word of God and it being obedient to the instructions. And then all the peace, all the joy, bathe it with a thankful heart. That's a winning combination. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for allowing us the privilege of prayer. As we close this time in your word, we ask that you guide and direct us to truly honor you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Myron?